So I'm going to do a bit of reflection, as Mike did. Mike and I, by happen chance, came to Dundee, both from Glasgow, um, 20 years ago. And so I'm looking back over working in Glasgow, but also working in, in Dundee. I'm going to say a little bit about Dundee's cultural journey, what's the journey the city's been on. And in particular, I was asked to say, how can culture be a driver for regeneration? So you can invest in lots of different styles of regeneration. And I'm going to try and look at why the decisions and investment decisions taken by Dundee around culture uh, may have, in some cases, uh, helped it to get to the point it's in today. Um, and I've, I've been in a number of different roles in Dundee, but the one consistent thing for me is um, I've always been interested in the way in which Dundee's community um, struggles with the face of it, in the face of adversity to be optimistic. It's an optimistic city with huge social challenges, and people engage very readily in the city when they're given the opportunity. And I think we've heard that uh, from other speakers today. So if you went back 20 years, we would be certainly a 20 to 1 outsider that we would be where we are today. And I think it's, it's no exaggeration to say that the kind of change in the city has been remarkable. And of course, that involves a huge number of factors. And I'm going to try and draw out some that I think are worthy of further exploration. Um, you've already heard it, but let me add to the list of media accolades that the city's pulled out. You've got the GQ magazine. Um, Sunday Times came out with a nice one. Um, Dundee's fizzing with energy, an attitude that deserves high praise for transformation. For, the trans for transforming itself and for, uh, from a dismal deprivation to a groovy creation hub. Um, the National Geographic, enormous circulation, and just in September there, a couple of months back, um, picking up Dundee uh, globally uh, as a city visit, and Wall Street Journal, and there are others. So it, it, is, it is pretty remarkable, and it's, it's really interesting that that has become the, the focus of media feedback and media attention, given where we were not that many, many years ago. Um, when I've, I could have put the slide at the end, but I thought I'd put up what I would say and what seems to be written about what makes for a successful cultural destination. I'm going to put it up and then I'm going to take, tell you the story and you can test the story against these criteria and see if you believe them might lead to some discussion. So there's got to be a reason for going somewhere. We go to cultural destinations, either because there's an iconic building, um, a must-see artifact, an event to be part of. That's one of the drivers that places, you could name them, um, that a cultural destination succeed. But to retain a visitor or to retain a family or to retain a diverse um, population, you have to have a diverse offer. And often that one artifact or that one building is not enough to get you there. There have to be excellent and credible transportation links. You can have a great event or a great building if it's a hassle to get there, and when you get there, you can't get accommodation, and the booking of it is problematic, you're just going to get turned off because the choice in the world today is too great, and the routes are too easy to make. So the hard ones are the ones that people do not respond to positively. And as somebody said earlier this morning, um, our core market is a food-loving culturalist. Kind of slightly clumsy phrase, but it holds it pretty well. People who are investing globally in going to cultural destinations expect a good food offer. They expect it to be authentic, they expect it to be of a good standard, and if it's not up to that standard, then again, you get damaged reputation. And if you get damaged reputation, all of these other criteria fail because of the prevalence of social media. And, and the other factor which seems to drive an awful lot of the best cultural destinations, not in terms of scale, but the ones that succeed best, are that they are able to combine natural attributes with the offer that they're making. So visitors are retained or they're driven to go to a place because it has a setting which inspires. And for those of you who know Dundee, and I am an incomer, albeit 20 years, I think it does certainly have a, a setting that inspires. It's a beautiful location. So the question that we've been asking people over the last wee period is, where do you date, where do you date Dundee's cultural-led regeneration from? And what is really interesting when you start going down that route is it's not something new. Years ago, the city was investing private money and public money in iconic statements of architectural ambition and regeneration, which were done with an element of civic pride for the benefit of not, the, not necessarily the person who made the investment, but the city as a whole. This is Baxter Park Pavilion, uh, Paxton. We had a Victorian Albert, as a number of you would know, before we had the V&A. So the Victorian Albert have been in Dundee since, if you take it, 1876. 
So, and they were built entirely by pi private philanthropy. The Victoria, um, what was it? the Victoria, the Albert Institute rather, was was a, a gesture um, of public giving from the rich philanthropists, uh, the mill owners, I guess, and others in this city uh, after the death of Prince Albert, the greatest cultural champion of his age. So that building there, which uh, exists today, is a great uh, local social history museum. The art, the, the art exhibitions, which it held uh, between 1889 and, and, and 1908, were the second richest to London in the United Kingdom. And people came from all over the world to trade fine art in Dundee. And Dundee's Orca collection is an example of that, with the beneficiaries of an incredible industrial heritage uh, of philanthropy and a culture of giving culture back to the city. Um, I'm just showing these, and I won't go through all of them, but in the space of about a decade, 10 Carnegie libraries were built in the city, each of which were listed buildings, most of which are still in existence today. And they're really, they're really fine, um, fine red sandstone buildings, have reinvented their purpose as cultural hubs within each of their neighborhoods and have a different purpose today from the one that they started off in life as. My point is, this is not uh, something which is new. The Caird Hall itself, by the name, it was James Caird that put up the money, and it was his sister that finished off the job of building the Caird Hall in Dundee. And it's been a fantastic resource for this city over the years, a cultural hub. The Mills Observatory, it was Mills that gave the money. Just an aside on that one, given uh, Karen's talk this morning, that was built as an employment creation project. And it was a job creation project of his day in the 30s. And actually, the people that worked there were a long-term unemployed who were given the opportunity. Do you want another anecdote about that? You ever in a pub quiz? That's the largest papier-mâché mâché dome in Scotland. We have to look after it very carefully. If it gets any holes, it will fall, fall apart very quickly. That's a papier-mâché dome, um, which is a Mills Observatory dome. So my point simply is this, that this is a journey this city's been on, and we're the beneficiaries of a legacy of long-term investment. The more interesting bit is where Mike picked up. He, he referred and referenced the, the opening of the new rep. The original rep was in a converted church. It burnt down. There was no rep for a number of years. There was a question about how it would go forward. The Scottish government, local authority, private sector uh, investors created this building, which opened in, in 1976. And really, since 1976, it's been the only full-time repertory company in Scotland. And today, it's the only full-time repertory company left in the United Kingdom, which is pretty scary. They're all now touring, uh, they're all doing, they're bringing in product, but they don't have a permanent company. And of course, this building um, was, was, was seen by many as a kind of kickstart to the current regeneration of the city. Others would pick the return of the discovery, a fantastic metaphor done by the Dundee Partnership, which is a partnership between the local authority and Scottish Enterprise at the time, and uh, the, the bringing back of discovery from London and the metaphor that it represents for the city, the way that it has been very eclectic in the way that it's been used by science, by schooling, by those who have educational difficulties, um, just as a metaphor for discovering yourself, discovering science, discovering the city. It's a great brand, actually. Um, in parallel to this type of activity, for years, Dundee has invested in public art. And to get a cultural space to create a place that people want to be relaxed in and discover it, you have to have great public art and great public spaces. The civic realm really matters. The walkway that Dundee is able to present uh, to, to, for, for its visitors is an incredible resource. I believe that in Dundee at the moment we've got something like 212 pieces, Mike can correct me, but something of the order of 212 pieces of public art. Um, there isn't actually a public art catalogue, and there's some discussion about making them more accessible for our visitors. But they are interesting, they're quirky, they're of this place, they all have a story behind them. And like the Ur Willy Trail that was so popular a couple of years ago, and I'm sure the Archie's Penguin Trail that would be popular this year, um, we need to use these as ways of bringing visitors into a city, not just for the one-stop destination that the V&A is, but to get them in and about and discovering uh, the city uh, in, in, in all its guises. Um, the rep developed a dance company which became Scottish Contemporary Dance Company. It's still based in Dundee, but it tours for about half the year internationally. And it's a great favorite of the culture secretary in Scotland. It's a, a medium which trans, uh, uh, transcends language. And uh, it's had like, like five separate performances at this year's Edinburgh uh, Festival and the Fringe. And it's a great resource. 
But what it has started to do is internationalize the way in which Dundee views itself culturally. The workforce of the Scottish Contemporary Dance Company have always had over 50% of their dancers from Firth of Scotland, Firth of Britain. And today it's something like two thirds of the dancers, I think, that come from other European member states that come to Dundee. The legacy of that is we have a nucleus of international dancers who live here and who work all over the world that have retained their uh, ownership of property here and remain here. Uh, and we've got this kind of really unusual cluster of professional dancers. And that, these, are, these are unusual attributes that come from investment in, in culture-led regeneration. For any destination to really hold visitors to attract them, heritage really matters. Your cultural story comes from your cultural heritage. So this place uh, and its sister building, the Verdant Works, which is the Jute Heritage Museum for Scotland, are incredibly important ways of telling our own story back to our young people and our population, as well as our visitors. And the, the restoration of the mill and the building, which is just up the road from the mill there, is one I might mention before I finish as well. That's the former DC Thompson Print Works that where the, the uh, design festivals have been held in recent years. And then, against the grain, um, there was a political leadership. There was a change from the, the old region and district councils to um, the uh, unitary council. And at that time, um, more than any other time, either my, my brief duration with Tayside or subsequently at that time, and again, I think today, there was a period of remarkable leadership in the city where people said, we're going to take a really a, a, a very brave decision. And the decision to build the Contemporary Arts Centre that Mike referred to again was completely against the grain. And it meant for a lot of bad press for the politicians that took the decision and the officers who were charged with putting it there. That's a separate story. But it was really, people were saying, what, a Contemporary Arts Centre when you've got housing problems and when you've got children in care and when you've got low educational achievement, what are you doing? What are you thinking about? And it took a very brave political decision to invest in something that might be a game changer for the city. Whatever it is, 20 years on, people now would say, well, it was, a, it was an obvious decision, it was an easy decision. It was not. It was a really tough decision to make. And I, I saw close up how people struggled with that and then had to defend it. In some cases, had to take the cost of that decision that we all have benefited from uh, since it was realized. And right at the same time as uh, doing that, the um, Scottish School of Contemporary Dance was formed in this city. And we have the largest number of professionally trained dancers coming out of the city. So I'm trying to give you a sense of it's, it's a jigsaw. Lots of little bits of it come together uh, and they take the city to where it is today. And to strategize it over the last 20 years, this is the, this is, I think was the second it is, of our um, four cultural, that's the third actually of our four cultural strategies. And we have been very um, forensic about where we would invest in Dundee. And the strategy is not a city council strategy, it's a partnership strategy, kind of as Annie was saying. It's all the cultural agencies, it's a cross-section of partners, and it goes under the brand of the Dundee Partnership, which is the city council and other public sector partners, saying what they will invest in over the forthcoming period. One of the things they invested in was the restoration of the, the uh, much-loved McManus and this wasn't exactly an easy job. If you look at the, the scale of the images there, I don't know if you can see them in that, in that slide, but this was uh, taking out, leaving the walls and gutting that building. Um, it would have been cheaper and easier to build a new gallery. The tough decision was to restore a building that was Dundee's most popular building and that was an icon of its heritage. And it was, I think, in part, a learning from what Mike said about the demolition of the Overgate project. Politicians had learned how unpopular, deeply unpopular, the loss of that urban environment was. And they were committed to tackling what, what was a really, it's a separate presentation, but a really fascinating project to, to save a building. That's what this was about. And it reopened in 2010. And, and, and still is incredibly popular. It's a place that grandparents take their kids to, to tell their own story. And it tells the story of the city rather well. So all of that led to the opportunity to bid for UK Capital Culture. And we'd already, in an earlier era, we decided not to bid because we felt the city wasn't ready for it. So we didn't bid for the UK Capital Culture first time round when Derry, get it, or Derry got it. We looked at it and didn't bid. But in 2013, we bid to become the UK Capital Culture. And we used the Creative Dundee Network. We used uh, social media. We had a fantastic campaign 
and there was a great sense of civic support for it. There was a great sense of civic disappointment when it went to Hull. But what is interesting with the benefit of hindsight is it didn't actually detract or deflect the city at all. We got all the social benefit from it. We got the commitment to completing jobs like the V&A Dundee, and it has helped to drive forward the journey. It also created the information that we needed to put forward a really strong bid to UNESCO. And for this city, of all cities, to become the UK uh, UNESCO City of Design is quite remarkable, actually. People just say, well, okay, we're using UNESCO City of Design. But if you look at the other design attributes around the UK, if you look at the uh, UNESCO network, um, for a little place like Dundee to be in that network is incredibly important. I think we undervalue it. We kind of take it for granted. But it has given us access to those cities and to the additional nine that joined uh, a couple of weeks ago. I wasn't able to update that slide. It's a tricky slide to update. Um, so you've, you've got a, an amazing family network there that we are um, connected to. And we've had direct contact with every one of those cities. A significant number of them have been to Dundee. And we have enabled colleagues from either the universities or from the cultural sector to be in a significant number of those cities. Um, so our next cultural strategy said, well, where do you go from here? You've bid for, you had really good feedback, you haven't won the UK capital of culture, you've got this inter international link. There's only one place to go, isn't there? And that's to try and bid to become the European capital of culture. And at the time, it came from a politician, it came from the leader of the administration. Um, I didn't tell him he was crazy, but I think he probably was being incredibly ambitious for this place. But that's what's driven it forward, ambition. And so the current ambition through this strategy over its fi first five year of action plan and over its 10 year duration is to actually bring to fruition a bid that would be credible of winning the European capital of culture. And if we win it, we'll deliver it. And paralleling this story is this little graph. And I extracted that from the Scottish Household Survey that you, you'll all know and love, I'm sure. <laughs> but what it shows is from this rather flawed data set that the, the data set that Scottish Household Survey is, I think it shows where Dundee was in 2012. And if you projected that line further back, our level of cultural engagement, that's the number of people who take part, who say they go to the cinema, theatre, the arts, our level of cultural engagement in this city was way, way below the Scottish average in any of our regional comparators. And if you look at what's happened in the comparatively short period of that, that slide projects and the trajectory goes on, it has been a, a very interesting and important trajectory for the city. So this is an internal one. It's for us. So this stuff is outward looking. It brings tourism. It brings jobs. It sustains the city's economy. But it's also for the citizens itself. And that's their statement about how they have benefited from this investment. Uh, most recently is uh, the opening of the um, Slessa Gardens, the first public event, and you might have seen this image before, was um, Pierre Gostet, a French installation artist, building this uh, arch, which was remarkable. Remarkable not only in the sense that it was a digital reconstruction in cardboard of the original arch. And you can see, I think, there the, the similarity and the closeness of what they did. It was remarkable in the sense that it was the first public engagement in Slessa Gardens. And it brought literally thousands, many, many thousands of people into both building the cardboard, folding up, taping up, constructing it, lifting it, because it was lifted section by section from the bottom. It was a fantastic bit of YouTube, speeded up YouTube, of the 12 hours of it being built. And it was there for 24 hours, and then pushed down and trampled and recycled. Um, so it was a kind of public engagement with our heritage in a cultural project, which was done by the citizens of Dundee. Ticked a lot of boxes for me, this one. Um, design Festival in West Ward, I'm not going to dwell on, um, but it represents another level of ambition. This building, which is the DC Thompson's former print works just up by the Heritage Trust, is a huge building. It's a really enormous disused print works. It could be demolished. It's a site that may be developed in future for housing. It could have a multiple use. It's not at the moment economically attractive to do that. And the owners have said, if you can use it for cultural purposes, we will gift it to you in perpetuity. So it is sitting there as a latent project which has been used in its undeveloped form, waiting the outcome of the Taste Cities deal. If it gets the Taste Cities deal, they would give a capital legacy. And what we would have is the largest new cultural hub in Scotland. It is absolutely massive. I can't even remember the square footage, but it's something absolutely vast inside. Uh, what it does is complement the V&A at Dundee. So you've got the new, briny, bright, shiny museum here, 
This would be, if you can imagine it, it would be much more of that type of space, a maker space um, where you can throw paint around and make things and do things in a slightly easier way than you could in this fabulous visitor attraction. So today we're at the point where um, we're going to open next year the building and we're going to bid next year to become European capital of culture. And I just wanted to end by sharing with you the kind of drivers that, that are here. And I, I, I can't give you these away, but the, the top line are the, 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 the program themes, connect, inspire, reveal, and grow. They're the things that the program is going to be developed around or has been developed around. And there are three values that underpin them. The value of trying to you reuse the metaphor of discovery, self-discovery, cultural discovery, scientific discovery, digital discovery, uh, evolution, looking at the way in which uh, we've evolved as a city, the way in which Gregor's diagram shows that the population was a nadar and it's come back up. We're actually building a new city in the city. We're rebuilding a population. And for them, they need to be engaged in that journey. They need to be consulted in that journey. They need to feel... Uh, as David said earlier, a, a commitment to what the city will look like if they're going to remain committed to it. And in all of that, because it's a cultural project, we want to tap into the imagination and get people to, to live and dream, if you like. Um, within a Scottish context, while Dundee's bidding is doing it with the support of Tay Cities, and it's made a very clear commitment that we would want to embrace in a year of culture in Scotland a festival in every month of the year. And most of these have been spoken to and, and there are a couple we still to complete the dialogue with. But the idea would be in every month of the year, we would be connecting a festival in Scotland that gives you two reasons for coming. You come to the European Capital of Culture and you go to Celtic Connections. And the nature of the discussion, I can mention Celtic Connections because it's the one we've gone furthest with. They'll commission work, they'll reveal it first here, and then they'll take it to Celtic Connections for the rest of their run. And we would like, like to have that relationship um, with, with them going forward. Our slogan is uh, evolved as be brilliant. We want the people of Dundee, the cultural agencies, the way the city is, is, is known is, is for being brilliant. And this is an attempt to get the logo onto the roof of that building, which uh, was rather a brilliant photo call. And very lastly, I just wanted to end with that image of the city. It, it is a remarkable city. It's in a beautiful place. And I've come to love it because it does tick all of those boxes that I was setting out earlier for what would really make a cultural destination. And it hasn't happened in one bound. It's happened for generations of people investing through civic pride in this place. Thanks. Thanks, David.